but a fun team here today. Really excited to check in with the community um, as we're ramping up to um, finally, 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 from my perspective, um, put some earth source heat stuff uh, in the ground. Um, the Cornell University Borehole Observatory is uh, on the near horizon and we're just really excited to check in with everybody today to let you know um, a little bit different kind of presentation about what you might actually be seeing and hearing and chances to interact with the project and project team. So we've got um, Oli Gustafson, who's a uh, professional geologist uh, working on the project in the College of Engineering and Terry Jordan, um, the fabulous faculty member, um, is going to talk about some of the community engagement that we have planned. So we both want to um, talk to you about what we're thinking and doing and definitely um, hear back from you, your feedback and your questions um, to take back to the project. So that's what we are up to. Um, let me see if I can get the share to cooperate. Okay, are you all seeing uh, Earth Source Heat introduction slide? Yeah? Okay, great. Um, okay. So super quick, uh, in case nobody on this call has heard of Earth Source Heat before, just a quick orientation of um, where it fits in Cornell's carbon neutrality plans. So we are striving to achieve carbon neutrality for the Ithaca campus by 2035. Um, that includes a goal to do it with 100% renewable energy. Uh, and big picture, uh, of course, we have lake source cooling supplying the majority of our cooling needs for campus already. Um, we have a, a very efficient uh, campus building fleet, building stock uh, that we are trying to make more efficient by the day. Sometime maybe we can talk to you all about that and how we've got all of our energy conservation initiative work loaded up into a public dashboard um, that's kind of fun to play with. Uh, we're looking for 100% renewable electricity. Of course, we've got the good old hydro plant, some solar farms, um, working, on, uh, working on more of that um, in parallel. And then one of the big nut to crack left for us is campus heating. Um, how are we going to heat the joint in this cold climate without burning something? Uh, so our, our plan A is this earth source heat project, um, which is deep direct use geothermal um, and there's a lot more information about what that is and background on the website, earthsourceheat.cornell.edu, and Oli and Terry will tell you a little bit more about that. Um, but if this works, um, it uses the internal heat of the earth to warm our campus without the use of fossil fuels. Um, if it's viable, um, it's good baseload heat, uh, doesn't take a lot of electricity. Uh, we know the uh, beneficial electrification is great, but has the downside of needing a lot more electricity, um, which is already challenging to get the renewables we need online. So that's one of the big benefits to earth source heat. Also no refrigerants, which we know are an extremely potent um, greenhouse gas in and of themselves. So if it's viable, um, doesn't just solve a problem for Cornell, leads to a scalable um, and affordable renewable energy solution uh, for any sort of large campus, large urban center, um, in the US and globally. So we're excited. Uh, we think one of the things we can really do at Cornell um, is to add to the solution set um, by developing and demonstrating um, sort of new breakthrough solutions. So that's that's what we're excited about and that's how it kind of fits in our big picture. Uh, and uh, definitely worth mentioning, heating is about half of our remaining energy emissions on campus um, and we're, uh, I don't know, Terry or Nick or somebody can rattle off what percentage of the county's energy Cornell represents. So if we, if we figure this out, um, it's a big piece for campus and it's a big piece uh, for the community to get to our, our climate goals. Um, okay, um, another exciting thing I want to talk to you all about, and again, this is kind of on this um, theme today of how we're trying to really connect with the community. So you may or may not know, and a bunch of you on this call are members of the Earth Source Heat Community Advisory Team, which we kicked off this summer. Um, and as the slide says, um, we hope this will be um, a pretty robust and long-term process for community participation. Make sure you guys know what's coming um, with the Borehole Observatory and um, depending what we find with that observatory, um, 
uh, our decision making process to um, hopefully move on to a, a real demonstration project to heat a portion of the campus with this technology. Um, you can see the folks listed. Um, one of the things that they have agreed to do is to serve as liaisons for the community. So if you aren't comfortable or don't know how to get a hold of somebody at Cornell and the Cornell project team, any of these folks can help you get to the right people and the right information. And we definitely want this to be um, a two-way dialogue. We don't want to just tell you what we're doing. We want to you know, hear your questions and, and hear your concerns and, and really engage. Okay, so that's enough from me. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Oli uh, to tell you what you might see happening on the ground with the, with the Kubo project. I'm going to stop sharing and mute myself. Yeah, okay. okay, take it away, Oli. And feel free to give a little more introduction about yourself as well. I did a very poor job. <laughs> yeah, so um, I would first of all like to just uh, say uh, thanks to Sarah for joining us while she's on vacation in the Adirondacks. So uh, that was going above and beyond for her to <laughs> come to our meeting this morning. Um, and I uh, am really happy to be here. I've never attended uh, one of your meetings before. And I'll just say, uh, you know, I'm a geologist. I, I do that because I, I've just loved uh, learning about the earth since I was a little kid. And um, I think that uh, figuring out how human beings can uh, sustainably inhabit our wonderful planet is a really, really important and a noble thing to be doing. Um, my background, uh, I've worked in environmental remediation work for a number of years uh, in, uh, for a consulting firm and then came to Cornell at the end of the 1990s to help with some of Cornell's uh, cleanup uh, projects and then transitioned over to uh, sustainable renewable energy projects in more recent years and uh, so resource heat is my focus right now. Um, so uh, can you guys see the slide I have up? Okay <clears throat> so uh, I'm just going to give a little overview of the borehole observatory or Kubo project uh, and um, yeah, so I'll just dive into that. So uh, here are some of the goals for, for Kubo. So we want to, it's our first step, as Sarah mentioned, in, in actually getting into the ground, ground truthing. Uh, a lot of preliminary work that we've done over the past few years to estimate the uh, potential for earth source heat to heat the Cornell campus. So uh, we want to, take the next step to really understand whether it, it makes sense to move forward. And um, so we need to ground truth a lot of estimated information and parameters that we've used up till now to, to uh, predict what we might be able to do as far as getting heat out of the deep bedrock beneath the campus. Um, and that will help us inform uh, geothermal systems design for campus. Uh, not only just um, you know, getting hot water out of the ground, but how to integrate that uh, most effectively into our heating systems and, and uh, the types of equipment, heat pumps and other things that might be integrated into that. Uh, and other information needed for, for the design and the planning of the project, which could be information about say water quality uh, to, to know like um, what sort of uh, uh, materials and equipment are needed to, to pump the, the water, um, information about flow rates, and uh, of course, information to design actual production wells if this looks um, promising. So uh, some of the questions we want to answer with uh, Kubo are, uh, can sufficient heat be produced? You know, we, we need to verify our estimates um, of, of heat production and, and uh, we're hopeful that we have a range of subsurface conditions that we think we can work with, but uh, we still need to get down there with an actual borehole and, and verify that at least at some depth interval, we can extract enough hot water to do this. And the uh, sustainability of that over many years is also something we'll need to estimate because uh, we need this to last more than just say a few months. And then of course, uh, there's risks related to things such as uh, induced seismicity and uh, water quality impacts. 
those are things that have been big issues with uh, drilling for oil and gas development. And we wanna make sure that as we do this uh, drilling project for geothermal, that we uh, are careful to address all of those potential issues and make sure that we move forward in a way that avoids any uh, negative consequences that aren't you know, acceptable to the community. And that leads us to the last bullet here, which is that we are concerned about community acceptance as well as uh, regulatory approvals. Uh, we don't see any big regulatory hurdles, but um, we want to stay engaged with the community. This is, uh, you know, we're part of the community. We want to come up with um, a project that will uh, be something everybody can, can feel good about and be proud of. And as Sarah mentioned, uh, hopefully be something that can be replicated elsewhere beyond Cornell. So here's a little diagram of uh, a cube of the earth and Cornell campus at the top showing uh, a bunch of layers of rock and the yellow line going down is, is a schematic of our, our uh, test borehole, the Kubo borehole. And um, in this uh, diagram, the, the, all these horizontal lines represent the, um, the different sedimentary layers that are present uh, beneath us. And our plan is to drill through all of those sedimentary layers and into the bedrock beneath those sedimentary layers, which is called the crystalline basement, uh, at least a short distance into that crystalline rock. That has not been uh, explored much at all with drilling. Uh, most of the previous drilling in our area has been focused on prospecting for oil and gas resources, which are in the shallower layers. So we're going to drill entirely through all those sedimentary layers and into the crystalline basement. There are targets uh, that could be, uh, that are look promising for heat extraction uh, in the lower part of the sedimentary rock, as well as the interface between the sedimentary and the crystalline basement, and even into the crystalline rock itself. And on the left, you can see uh, a lot of the types of measurements and tests that we plan to complete using uh, Kubo to uh, gather the information we need to improve our models and do our risk analysis, uh, as I mentioned in the last slide. And then should conditions look favorable and the risks look manageable or acceptable, uh, we will uh, move on to planning a uh, demonstration system and that would involve drilling two additional boreholes that would go down into some target layer. Uh, this diagram shows the target being down in the crystalline basement but it, it may be in a slightly shallower layer if, if that looks more promising. But uh, we would need two wells, one to uh, pump out the hot water and another to return that water after we've taken heat from it and cooled it down. The same water would be put back down into the ground in a nearby well, where it could then flow through the fractures in the rock uh, and get heated up and go back to the uh, extraction well again. And uh, there's a lot that goes into the design of that. You need to figure out the orientation of the wells and how far apart they need to be and pumping rates and pressures and things like that. So um, that's all things that we, we hope to uh, be able to address with the information we gather from this test borehole. And then the, the Kubo borehole will be left in place if we get to this demonstration phase uh, as an observation borehole that can be used to monitor what's going on with the pumping system. Um, so it will be there uh, available to put instrumentation in, to take measurements and to uh, monitor the effectiveness and safety of, of the pumping system should we get to that point. So where is Kubo going to be drilled? Um, <clears throat> the map here in the middle shows uh, the Cornell campus in the center and surrounding areas uh, and some uh, uh, red square shows the drill site and the two circles dash circles show uh, one quarter mile and one half mile radius around that site. And, and that was something we drew up just as we were doing a site selection process to try to find a location that was 
you know, kind of in the middle of the Cornell controlled lands that would be away from residential areas or uh, other uh, facilities that we you know, wanted to stay away from just to have a buffer from from a drilling project to up to uh, properties that might be um, sensitive to to the drilling uh, disturbance. So we identified the Palm Road parking area shown in the upper right as a good location. It's got a good buffer to uh, residential areas or sensitive research facilities. It's an already disturbed area that uh, is currently a gravel parking area. <clears throat> So some of the issues that we've been thinking about and talking to uh, interested people in the community about uh, have to do with you know, the impacts from, <coughs> from drilling on the area and on the community. So I see I have a typo in here in previously, that's a weird, weird word. Um, so, you know, using a, a, an area that's already a gravel parking lot is, is obviously a, a big advantage. We, we're not developing a green space here. Uh, and the drilling project, the duration is expected to be about six weeks. Um, the borehole will remain in place after that for other testing, but the, the drilling itself <coughs> should be about a six week project. Truck traffic is always an issue with, with construction projects. Um, there's not a lot of truck traffic associated with, with this type of drilling, mainly just to mobilize <clears throat> the rig in. It, it takes several trucks to bring the rig in pieces and then it gets assembled on site and then demobilize it at the end of drilling. Uh, we're not going to be trucking a lot of water or anything like that. We'll use our own Cornell water system. So, uh, <clears throat> There will be some truck traffic, but, but nothing uh, less than a typical construction project would have. And we are committed to using an electric drill rig, uh, which will avoid big, <coughs> noisy, and smelly diesel generators. Um, site lighting is, is an issue. This will be a 24 hour a day operation. Um, and you know, we wanna make sure that we don't have uh, a lot of light pollution from it. So we are going to work with the contractor to uh, make sure that their lighting has cutoffs and is uh, as unobtrusive as possible. Uh, water usage, as I mentioned, will be from the Cornell water system and the total for the project <clears throat> will be quite a bit less than one day of normal usage for the campus. And then after drilling is completed, there won't be a whole lot left. There will be a pipe sticking up out of the ground uh, with some valves and things on it uh, that will represent the top of the, the well. And we expect to have a small testing trailer on site for a few months after drilling is completed to host uh, people and equipment involved with uh, follow-on testing we'll be doing. And the well dimensions, um, <clears throat> it, it gets drilled in, in a telescoping manner where there are, uh, you start out with a wider hole at the top and put in uh, a steel pipe, a casing, and then uh, that goes down a few hundred feet and then you go to a narrower diameter and go you know, a few hundred feet more and then telescope down four times, <clears throat> eventually getting down to uh, 10,000, foot target depth, it will be about an eight inch diameter hole down at the bottom. And just for scale, I was looking around, you know, two mile, a two mile deep borehole, you know, what things are two miles apart. And it just so happens that uh, the distance from McGraw Tower to uh, West Tower uh, on Ithaca College campus is almost exactly two miles. So that is a way to visualize um, how far we're, we're planning to drill. And uh, just for scale, that's about 0.1% of the distance to the Earth's core. Uh, so uh, while there is quite a bit of heat at 10,000 feet, it's, it's uh, still in the shallow crust of the Earth and not near any magma or any other things like that. Although, as you can see behind me, this is a picture I took in Iceland last week, uh, magma does sometimes come to the surface. <laughs> <coughs> So what's the status of uh, the project? So um, a couple of months ago, when we started looking into bidding and contracting all the work needed for this large drilling project, we uh, 
explored doing a turnkey operation that would have been the easiest way to, for, for Cornell to proceed would have been to get one contractor that would do all of the drilling work and hold all the subcontracts. And uh, we reached out to a lot of people that do drilling and related work, and there was some interest in that. But you know, in the end, um, we determined that wasn't viable. We didn't really get a, a great response using the turnkey model. Um, people just didn't really want to get into uh, managing aspects of the work that, that weren't in their wheelhouse. So that uh, leaves us with a more standard model, which is that Cornell will have to separately bid out uh, a bunch of different pieces of the work. You have the drill rig itself, but then there's other supporting services that are provided by other companies. So we're in the process now of, of working through uh, development of, a, of the different bid documents that we'll need for the various services. We have a, a really good geothermal drilling consultant on board, Capuano Engineering, and uh, they're very experienced and uh, really good to work with. Um, so that process will take uh, uh, probably most of the fall. Uh, and then we, at the end of that process, we'll select uh, the firms to do the work and negotiate the contracts and finish our DEC drilling permit application. And we expect at this point to be drilling early in 2022. That's uh, still a little bit, you know, of uncertainty in the schedule. But like I said, I don't, I don't think we'll be drilling this fall. At one point, I think we had Hope to do that, but um, I think it'll take us the fall to get uh, all the contract stuff in place. And in parallel with all of that, we are continuing with our uh, kind of background monitoring projects that we started a year or more ago, which include monitoring uh, the groundwater, the shallow groundwater near the site, um, and surface water in Cascadilla Creek, and noise and size background seismic activity in the in the local area. Those are all um, background monitoring projects that uh, will then continue through any drilling work to make sure we can compare um, what we see during drilling with, with the background and ensure that we're not uh, causing unacceptable impacts in any of those uh, areas. And that's uh, my presentation. So um, I'll send it back to you, Sarah. Great, thanks, Oli. Um, before we move on to Terry, um, Oli, Sarah has had a question in the chat. She said the graph of the demonstration showed an open system at the bottom rather than a closed loop system. Could you explain this more? Whoops, and Tony, Tony is just chatted back. <laughs> uh, Kubo is first, earth source heat next. Only earth source heat will need connectivity. And if we move on to that phase, um, so we can talk a little bit more. Um, Oli, did you want to? Um, anything to that or yeah that that that's uh right right now we're we're just putting in the exploration borehole any potential demonstration system uh would be you know something we would have a lot more conversations about after kubo before we got to that point but we do envision that it would be an open system where um open in the sense that there's it's not all enclosed in pipes but uh most of the water uh, almost 100% of it um, would flow from the injection well back to the extraction well, uh, just because of uh, the the pressures that you induce by by the pumping system. So, but uh, yeah, that's something that we can talk about more later if uh, if there's more questions about it. Yeah, this is like drawing the the water back up. If I understand correctly, uh, you know, creates a negative pressure, so that's all the you know the available water is going to want to go go that direction. That's right. Yeah. Yep. Um, okay, and it looks like Irene and Tony are getting some questions answered in the chat around methane. So we will we'll let that process carry on. And if there's unanswered questions, um, surface that again at the end. Um, but now I'm gonna hand it over to Terry. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. All right, I'm going to steal the screen. So um, I, we didn't introduce Susan Riley and Tony and Graffy, but they're here also. <laughs> um, so let me see. Are you seeing my full screen or my presenter view? Your presenter view. 
Is it, that's not full screen. Okay. We are seeing we are seeing just your slides now. You're presenting. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, oh, so yeah, thank you. <laughs> so I'm Terry Jordan. Like Oli, I'm a geologist, but I'm a faculty member in the Department of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences. And the reason I'm part of the Kubo project team is for the numerous background studies that have been conducted that lead us to believe that there are hot rocks at interesting shallow enough depths to be economic here in central New York. And also when the borehole data are, are well, when the drilling is going on and, and samples are pouring out, uh, digital samples and physical samples, I'll be part of interpreting that and part of helping our team to understand all that. But my, my skill is not in designing the next phase. The, is this good for earth source heat as a follow on? So given that I'm not going to be so occupied with that, um, I've become the person who's sort of the technical project point person for education and outreach. Um, in that capacity, I'm therefore working much more closely than I ever had before with universities, uh, communication specialists, um, community engagement specialists. So while much of what I think about is how do we communicate engineering and geology to the public um, as a, a technical specialist, we're also certainly engaged in how do we do this to provide what the community here in Ithaca or Tompkins County needs to know. So we have we have multiple missions. Um, and oops. So the the range of topics we consider to be be appropriate for for hey, us. Terry. Yep. I'm sorry to interrupt, but it looks like your screen share stopped. That, I oh, well, know. we'll try again. Hmm. Screen share. Thank you. We went, yes, I went back to seeing you. That was fine, Sarah, but not right. Um, so we, we consider our mission for education and outreach to extend across a whole broad domain. How about the reasons that energy transformation is needed? The relative merits and, and complications of the various kinds of solutions. That's one domain. What is the geology of the subsurface of Ithaca that as Oli presented it? Um, we have a wonderful teaching moment here. If the public is curious about why are you drilling a hole in the ground and what is there? Um, in order to access the subsurface, in order to provide the sort of data that Oli has just explained why, why we need it in order to go ahead and evaluate risks, mitigate risks, design a, a follow-on or make decisions about follow-on. That's all about engineering devices that create a hole in the ground, that test the rock properties, that test the fluid conditions and pressure conditions. So that's a, a, one of our, again, a learning opportunity and we, we want education outreach materials to cover that. And then clearly the, the broader issues of what are the challenges, what are the risks, um, what can be mitigated, how do you approach mitigation, and if you're going to make decisions, can we mitigate or not? So all of those are, are within the scope of education and outreach. So that's a whole lot of different, a, a broad cross-section, and how we spend our time at any given moment can be influenced by what the community is most interested in. So good of you to give us input. So we are envisioning four types of audience, just real broadly. We've got the, the K-12 program and the curious adult population locally and globally who wanna know why on earth and how would one extract hot water from the ground for heating. We have people closer to home, like you, the, the stakeholders here in Tompkins County. 
Um, if, as both Sarah and Oli have mentioned, the intent, and it is a major intent of this innovation effort, is that this method of heating can be extended beyond Cornell to really make a regional or global impact on um, reducing fossil fuel use, then we need to have involved the policymakers and the energy business specialists who will make the decisions about whether to go forward elsewhere with this. And of course, then we have Cornell's internal and alumni populations. So those are audiences of numerous kinds. We are expecting, we're operating on the principle that the sort of the, the materials that express what's going on in this project that would be used for any of these audiences have overlap among them, a lot of commonality, but we also expect that the strategies for interacting with those different groups and, and getting to them the materials we create and hearing from them, the questions have got to differ depending on the groups. As far as what we are focused on here in the near, ter near term to um, as our, our educational materials, um, these include, we are anticipating some sort of a visitor booth, place, kiosk, signage at the drill site so that if people come by, there are, there's information available and there will be some times when the science engineering drilling team can talk with pub the public and answer questions. You know, they can point what's going on over there and we can talk about it. Um, we are cur currently creating two kinds of, of visuals um, with photosynthesis productions. We're currently producing and just a week ago released the first of our videos on the Kubo project and more are in progress and more will come out as drilling goes. And also the Cornell communications team has created and continuing to create new animations to explain how this, what is going on in the um, assembly of a completed well, um, in how little various devices work and the plan for how would this make sense to distribute heat to the Cornell buildings. So animations and videos are in progress. Um, websites have been either significantly updated. Um, there's um, one that already, well, there's two that existed. This deep geothermal heat dot engineering focused on the technical background material pre-Kubo, but now it also has a big section that's focused on education. And the university's earth source heat dot cornell.edu site um, that you know, provides the, the, there'll be overlap between the two, but that one is the, the place to go for information about the university's official plans and you know, best knowledge currently of the project. Um, with PRI, and I'm happy to have some of my PRI cohort collaborators here work here on the meeting. We are creating materials that can be used for uh, out for the school teacher system. We've done some a workshop, um, and so these materials are intended to be helpful to your organization, if you'd like, and your questions help us to decide what material gets used. And then lastly, we are trying to put these materials into physical displays that can readily be taken in a car to an event and set up for interactions, you know, conversations at, at the display. Um, as fewer and fewer events are happening personally, this, you know, in person, um, this is not currently been our highest priority because we haven't figured out where it will get used first. 
Um, so if you have any in-person events coming up, that might help us to decide where we start. But we're making the plan. We just haven't kind of executed it. And I think, oh, I and I have mentioned already that I'm a geologist. My colleagues are engineers and geologists. We're not experts at education and outreach. So we're very happy to be able to collaborate with experts. Um, from Paleontological Research Institute, Don Haas, who's on the call, and Rob Ross are, are extremely <laughs> appreciated for their help so far. And at Photosynthesis Productions, Deborah Horde is um, you know, showing great uh, leadership in the development of videos. So that is what I have. Great. Thank you, Terry, and thank you, Oli. Um, just point out for folks, there's some really interesting Q&A thread happening in the chat. Um, I think Oli is working on answering Irene's questions about noise and proximity to the creek. So while that's happening, um, Peter, do we have a little bit of time for uh, some Q&A yet? Maybe I'll just share. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's sure. keep the conversation going. Okay, I'll stop sharing too. I just want to make sure people see there's our source heat at cornell.edu, which will get you to those resources that Terry was talking about. Uh, if you want to know more about our overall climate action plan, climate action at cornell.edu, and then email sustainability at cornell.edu. Um, any questions, and we'll, we'll help. Um, We'll get your answers if we have them. Uh, we'll put it on the list of stuff to get answers for with Kubo if we don't. <laughs> um, okay, let's see faces. So maybe I'd suggest if you have a question, just unmute yourself and have at it. Hi, Sarah, this is Paul Moore. Um, a couple of meetings ago, you mentioned that there were, um, in case this didn't work, four alternatives that were being developed. Are those in parallel to this or in series to this in terms of development so that you meet to the 2035 date in terms of design and development and everything? Mm -hmm. uh, yep, good question. So uh, what are we gonna do if first source heat doesn't pan out essentially is the, the question, right? Um, so currently we're thinking that, um, you know, ground source heat pumps on a commercial scale uh, or, a, you know, sort of a district energy scale um, would be the solution. We do have, um, we're excited that one of our buildings that is uh, not currently connected to our district energy system. Um, one of the reasons that earth source heat is such a great solution for Cornell is because we have this district energy solution. So as soon as our energy supply is renewable, everything connected to it becomes uh, renewably supplied. But we do have a couple of buildings, you know, on campus that are not connected, including the Child Care Center, uh, which we're excited is moving forward um, with a new heating system with ground source heat pumps. So that will help us, you know, kind of figure that out in terms of management um, on campus. And then you know, pass it back to Oli. Part of the work and that I think is really exciting um, with some of the um, research that's already happened with Earth Source Heat is looking at how to um, integrate heat pumps to an extent. So Oli, do you want to speculate a little bit more about, about that and you know what, what might be plausible um, in the event? Sure. Um, so as plan B, you mean? Um, both work. as plan B and how the work we've been doing with earth source heat and potentially right. integrating some um, heat pumps um, helps us be ready for plan B. Right. So, yeah, heat pumps, uh, you know, uh, are a great technology and, and obviously conventional geothermal, shallow geothermal systems, uh, you know, use, use heat pumps um, and use the, the, the moderate temperatures of the shallow subsurface as a, as a heat sink or heat source for, for heating and cooling. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the advantage to uh, the deep geothermal earth source heat system is that for heating is, you know, we, we're starting with really warm water already, and we might have to boost that temperature a little bit with some heat pumps. But um, if, if we have to do that, the efficiency 
is is much much better than a shallow um, ground source heat pump system. So, you know, the the coefficient of performance, which measures how much heat you can get out versus the electricity that you have to put into the system, is much much higher for for the resource heat model. And but integrating heat pumps gives a lot of flexibility, though. If, if we if we said, well, we need you know water at 180 degrees Fahrenheit, and you know we have to we have to get that out of the ground, that would really limit our our options as far as finding the right target uh, depth for extracting heat. But with heat pumps, you know we can operate with a range of temperatures. If we get something that say it's 150, 160 degrees, it's not quite hot enough to provide all the heat we need. We can boost that up with heat pumps. At, that are operating in a very efficient range and using uh, relatively low amounts of additional electricity to do that. So that whole thing is, is an area of, um, of innovation and research uh, that we ex hope to really demonstrate that and, and that kind of flexibility of using uh, water in a, in a different variety of temperature ranges potentially, um, you know, makes it a much more flexible type of system that could not only for Cornell, but for potentially implementation elsewhere. Thanks, Oli. Um, looking at chat questions, uh, maybe Tony, could you chat back and answer to Sarah Hess's question about potential for radon, et cetera, or, or Oli? I'm uh, typing it right on. now. Do it, you're the best. Um, and then, <laughs> <laughs> it's a virtue. I need some. Um, I see Don's comment. Um, Don, can I put that back at you um, and ask you um, help us understand from your perspective what that would look like and how we could do it? Well, I, I think um, there's been a lot of thinking lately just around how to do communication to communities. Um, reaching people in different ways, reaching people who might speak different languages, reaching people, certain communities that might not be receiving information, say always on the internet or something like this. Um, and so it's really having, I wondered if there was a plan or um, a plan to have a plan for a communication strategy that always also now keeps sort of uh, inclusivity, equity in mind. Thanks. Yeah, so I would say yes is the short answer to your question. Um, and uh, again, um, this is such a cool group of people uh, thinking and working in all of these ways. I would love to hear from all of you um, suggestions for how we could do that. <laughs> We've got some plans, but yeah, go ahead, Don. Um, we are certainly, uh, planning to reach as many different communities and as many different stakeholders as we can um, and sensitive to uh, issues about um, differences between communities and the way they access information. We are very early in the, the planning stages on this, but uh, so your input's welcome, but, but know that we're, we're sensitive, sensitive to that and um, planning on working with as many different communities as we um, we think are uh, connected to the issues and we think pretty much everyone is. Yeah, and if you have um, ideas, um, even after this moment, um, please stick them an email or, or otherwise communicate them to us. Um, it would be really helpful. We can share some uh, resources from Cooperative Extension and we're, we're also thinking about and, and growing our ideas how to, how to do this well and do it better, do our own communication better. Thanks, John. Okay, is there anyone? Um, do we miss anything in the chat? If you want to pipe up and point us at it. I think we've got most of those. Um, and maybe maybe our time's up, Peter, but just know that um, we wanna hear from you. <laughs> so if you have 
afterthoughts, you know, real time, just please, please, please reach out. Thanks so much, Sarah, and, and thanks to uh, Terry and Ole and uh, Tony for uh, being here to, to answer uh, questions from folks. Um, and just so everybody knows, I'll be sending out a link uh, to uh, the recording, which will be on the cloud for about a month. And also we'll send out the, uh, the chat uh, file. Um, so any links or answers to questions there uh, will uh, be available.